ready. Okay. <clears throat> Montana's got the microphone. Governor Randall Palmer from Reuters. Uh, is there any concern, does the Bank of Canada, do you have any concern of a possible currency war being triggered by, by China, by China's devaluation of its yuan? Uh, <clears throat> no, I don't have concerns uh, about a currency war. Um, I think, uh, as I said in my speech, economies are in different situations. Those who are attempting to ease policy or easing policy for, for those reasons. The world in general is in kind of a soft, is in a weak position, uh, still gathering some strength, but it's still well below its potential. And so, on average, central banks are still in an easy situation or easing. And um, if if uh, what pe people think of as currency wars is one central bank cuts rates, then another central bank cuts rates, and the exchange rates are not moving. Well, that just means that two central banks have cut rates. It means that on average, there's been an easing in the world. Uh, it's not a war. It's just a process that goes in a certain uh, order. So you have no concerns about, <clears throat> or do you have any concerns about the fact that, that the currency has devalued, the yuan has devalued, and do you think it's just a natural process? Well, I consider uh, right now <clears throat> the, uh, the Chinese economy is going through, as we've described it in our NPR, a transition to a slower, more long-term sustainable growth track. And if part of that adjustment means that the currency goes down uh, for a time, that, that would be the way the economy usually works. Um, and so, uh, no, I, I don't have any concerns. Each central bank runs their monetary policy on their, their domestic uh, situation. Hi, Governor. Happy New Year. Thank you. Uh, with that year. said, uh, <laughs> wanted to ask you about China. Uh, as you know, for a second day, uh, trading has been suspended. I uh, wanted to get your thoughts uh, on, on the turmoil that's uh, happening in China, if, how, if that will have any impact in Canada. Also, within that question, uh, some of the policies implemented in China, whether it's the circuit breakers or caps on investment, are, are they doing more harm than good? Uh, well, I guess, for, first of all, um, of course, uh, events in China affect the world. Whether they affect Canada directly or indirectly, they do affect uh, Canada. So it's, uh, of course, something uh, of interest, something we're watching closely. Um, circuit breakers, uh, most most uh, exchanges have them. Um, they're there for a reason. It's, be, it's because things can get a little too uh, hot at times. That's what they're there for. Uh, to make sure that uh, investors have have the opportunity to think about their positions and then adjust uh, appropriately. So, um, do, do uh, I think I'm, I, on a China-specific note, I would also say that the <clears throat> the stock market um, is uh, is uh, probably a lot more volatile than its than its fundamentals. So that we shouldn't necessarily look at uh, uh, volatility in their stock market as indicative of something substantial happening underneath the surface in their economy. Uh, I think we understand reasonably well that their economy is going to a more moderate growth track, but <clears throat> a growth track that's you know six or seven percent versus uh, eight or nine percent five years ago is a very very strong growth track in global terms, uh, given the size of their economy. So that continues to be a source of growth for the world economy and will continue. And, uh, and domestically, I was hoping to pick up on your line um, in your speech <coughs> about uh, oil prices or Canada's economy must, must work itself out. Uh, I'm hoping you can expand on that because it it's, sounds like it's, it's a fairly blunt thing to say uh, right. when many people are worried about the direction of our economy. Right. So <clears throat> I, th I think what, we, what I'm trying to emphasize, uh, Richard, is that the, there's, there's simply nothing that a policymaker can do about the price of oil. The price of oil has gone down, and, and so the adjustments that are thrown up by that simply have to happen. Uh, you can't in some way avoid them. You're able to perhaps use policy tools to cushion the blow here and there, but, and the exchange rate, as I argued. Uh, does help to buffer some of those effects, but but buffering or shock absorbing is not, you know, offsetting, uh, not in not nearly in its entirety. 
And uh, the biggest picture there is that the, the loss of income that Canada is sustaining in this situation simply has to be adjusted to. And there, it, 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 it can't be made up somehow by something else. Uh, economic growth <clears throat> can, can, be re can and will return through the other 80% of the economy, and over time we can recover from all of this in growth terms and in our, the level of our economy. Uh, but we will be losing investment in an important sector throughout, throughout this piece, and therefore Canada's potential, as we think of it, will be lower permanently in level terms because of that contraction in the energy sector. And the equivalent to that is that permanent loss of income. I use the word permanent <clears throat> in an economist sense. That is to say, we don't know when oil prices might recover, uh, but most, most economists think that, that looking further down the road, uh, that, that prices are likely to be higher. Uh, but when is a very hard thing to say. And that's just to say that we'll be talking about that then. And uh, then some of the process we're talking about today will go the opposite direction, as they did during the 2002-2014 period. Hi, Julie Van Dusen, CBC. Um, I'm just looking for you to qualify the Canadian economy. Um, from your speech, you talked about a lot of issues <coughs> that are problematic, and you described them all. But what words would you use? Is it, is it scary, sluggish? Does it give you sleepless nights? Where are we at? Well, <coughs> Julie, in two weeks we'll, uh, we'll give you a whole new forecast, and I, I don't want to uh, preempt all the work, good work of our staff. We're just in the middle of getting ready for the interest rate announcement on the 20th of January. Um, but if we, if we just look at uh, the broad picture, uh, what, we, what we've got to bear in mind is that the economy has to go through the adjustment that uh, Richard and I were just talking about. And that, will, that undercurrent will last for several years. So that, that sense that the economy is adjusting to something underneath the, the, the tensions between sectors and between regions will remain a feature for some time measured in years, it typically takes uh, three or five years to adjust to a significant movement in your terms of trade, which is what we're going through. The headline of the economy, though, can continue to gather strength because what's happening is the other 80% of the economy is adjusting and is, in fact, adjusting in a positive way uh, to these new conditions. So it's, as I've said all along, it's all about when do the positives that we can already see in the other 80% of the economy become the dominant part of the story because the negatives from the energy sector are still quite present. Uh, we saw that in the second half of the year that, that, was, that seemed to be true, that we've got more positives than negatives, but the negative from the energy sector will last for some time. So a follow-up, <clears throat> is infrastructure spending the, the panacea? Is this uh, going to get everything out of the rut or is this just going to be a little blip that helps out? Well, infrastructure spending, um, you know, economists think of it as a good thing almost all the time uh, because uh, infrastructure is an ingredient to economic growth. It's a sort of an enabler of economic growth. And so if your underlying trend rate of growth, which we call the potential of the economy, is gradually slowing down, it's slowing down because our labor force growth is slowing down as baby boomers like me come closer to retirement. So we've gone through the past 40 years almost of much more rapid growth uh, on average, and not just Canada, but in many countries, most of the world in fact. The post-war baby boom fueled that stronger growth rate. So we do all have to gear back our expectations about how fast growth will be when it gets back to normal. It will be a lower growth rate. So in our monetary policy report in October, we laid out our potential growth rates, they're below 2%, you know, for the, for the long-term growth rate in the economy. But what we expect is the economy will, over, over this transition to, to, to um, full employment, will grow faster than its potential. That's how we close the gap, because uh, we have a gap right now, and it actually widened during the course of 2015. Hi, Governor. Uh, Andy Blatchford, the Canadian Press. Andy. Um, are you expecting the federal government's middle income tax cut to stimulate economic growth? <coughs> if so, by how much? 
I'm not in a position to answer that today, Andy. We will uh, we'll offer that up uh, in the uh, the update on the 20th of January, when we've got our full forecast on the table, because it happens within the context of a whole forecast. I can say that my staff are collaborating with uh, the, the economists over at Finance to make sure that we have an understanding. They have the much more detailed models of how these fiscal things work. That's a fairly uh, it's not a simple dollar amount is because you're changing two two things at once and so uh, there's there are discussions there so we'll have the right thing built into our forecast uh, based on their analysis uh, but at this time I haven't I haven't uh, got that number on me and going back to the uh, infrastructure investment from the federal government uh, how quickly do you think the any fiscal <clears throat> stimulus from this could start helping well, on that also I don't know. Uh, it, it, uh, the government has said that it plans to uh, do some things, and I won't offer comments on on what or in what form. Uh, what our policy is that we will incorporate it into our outlook when we know those details. And at this stage, we simply don't know those details. So that's uh, I guess we won't know until budget time. So I think the order is uh, Market News, Bloomberg, Brian Lilly, and then Wall Street Journal. <clears throat> by order of uh, raising their hands, sorry. Um, Yadin Jai from Market News International. Uh, in the latest uh, financial system review, you said that um, the probability of a prolonged weakness in commodity prices is medium. Um, and so I wanted to know, given the latest uh, events since uh, last month, if this has changed, is it still a medium probability of it occurring? And also, could you qualify prolonged? <coughs> Yes. Well, so uh, when when we wrote that uh, that piece, um, we were already in the midst of this what appears to be a, another another phase of a downturn in in uh, in those markets, and uh, so what we had in mind more was not the the sort of creeping uh, grinding downturn that we've continued to see. Uh, but something that would put the financial system at risk, when that's what we're analyzing the FSR, is whether there are risks that threaten the, uh, the, the Canadian financial system itself. Uh, so in that, in that case, what we have in mind is something like a, a, what we call a tail risk, a tail event where there's a, a very significant and sudden de decline in, in, um, in commodity prices beyond what, what we've been contemplating, and that it would last for a significant period now. When we say prolonged, we usually measure prolonged in, in at least uh, months or quarters. I mean, it, it, probably a year, let's say. You know, So we have already endured, let's say, a prolonged decline in commodity prices because it's been about a year since it really started to move. Um, and so that's, that's part of our core thinking. We'd be talking like another one of those, which is, a, which is another big shock which we have not seen in, in recent events. Uh, so um, I would still still rate that as medium. My sense is that um, the, <clears throat> the global economy continues to be in a reasonable place and that uh, we, we will see a certain amount of um, stabilization in, in those things. But when, when we have uh, markets moving for, uh, for a variety of reasons, they're not always driven just by fundamentals, but but by financial players and, and the, uh, the way markets interact, markets tend to be more volatile than the underlying fundamentals. Um, that's always the case. Good morning. Uh, Greg Quinn with Bloomberg News. Uh, your speech mentioned uh, the currency's declined quite a bit and said it could be an important way for economies to adjust. Um, in a world of divergence, does it stand to reason then if, if there's more divergence, the currency can continue to play a role as being the, the workhorse of how Canada adjusts to the shock? Well, it, what, de what it depends on, Greg, is the underlying shock itself. And so the most visible measure of that today would be the oil price or possibly commodities more generally, so industrial materials, because uh, the oil is not the only thing that's gone down significantly. Um, and so we know that uh, we have a very long history over which the Canadian dollar seems to track that quite closely. And in that sense, the you know, divergence is kind of the product uh, emerges, which we just, I mean, you think of as divergence as perhaps one economy growing faster than another economy, uh, 
Um, well, that's kind of like an intermediate part of the process. The underlying shock is what's driving that divergence that interacts with policies of various sorts to give you the, the, the final bottom line of how closely economies track each other. And so all those things figure in a, in a general equilibrium model. You can't summarize that in a quick, quick thing. So they would, they would mean, they, they would produce a certain amount of exchange rate variability in all, all directions because all of those things go into exchange markets. Uh, but over the, the smooth, if you like, the longer term analysis, the principal driver is the terms of trade. And you, know, you can see that very well on a chart. So I can't predict, you, you know, it would be foolish to try to predict what exchange rates might do. Um, but all I want to emphasize in the speech is that over the course of history, and including the history that will be written in 2016, that exchange rates will play a role uh, in helping economies adapt and adjust to the shocks that we're seeing um, that, that are happening to all of us. And as I said, it pushes some economies up while pushing others down. How the final uh, outcome looks is dependent on so many other variables. You just can't predict it. I believe George Soros said this morning that what's happening in China and the world now has uh, echoes of, of 2008, 2009, that era. <coughs> um, wondering if you can comment on, you know, we have seen a lot of uh, stock market woes in China. Can you elaborate a bit more? Is, is this a thing that could develop into the kind of risk that, that would merit a response from the bank? Well, as we discussed uh, in our FSR, um, one of the key catalysts or the risk that we've, we've discussed in there is if there were a, ma a major disruption coming from China. We, we normally have in mind in terms of growth, that is, if, if, if the volatility that China's seeing were to produce, you know, a significant, a significant slowdown in their economy, that would affect many economies and it would, of course, include ourselves as significant exporters uh, uh, to China. So. Um, that's a very hypothetical at this stage. We, you know, uh, I, I wouldn't comment specifically on what Mr. Soros said, but um, there's, there's, there's no question that the, the stresses and the, the uh, preconditions that are there were something that we all have already written about in the FSR as something which is worth watching and being thinking about how would that play out if it became a problem. But. Uh, as, I, as I see it right now, the Chinese economy is still growing, and we, but I don't have a new forecast for you today, and we'll, uh, we'll, see, we'll talk more about that perhaps in two weeks. Okay. We're kind of running out of time, and I know a lot of people still have questions, so we'll take Brian and then uh, Kim, and we'll, we'll do one in French if that's okay. Okay. Yeah. Brian Lilly with rebel.media. You <coughs> don't think I'm the only person in the room that listening to you talk about the benefits of the lower dollar thought it's almost like you're cheerleading or happy that the dollar is low. And on Western ears, where they are dealing with the negative side of the economy right now, that may sound like, oh, another Eastern or Central Canadian just saying good things are back to the way they should be. You want to respond to that? Are, are you cheerleading for a lower dollar? Well, uh, certainly not. So, you know, I, I have no uh, influence, none of us do, over price of oil, and I've just said that the, the chart between oil and the Canadian dollar looks like a pair of train tracks. And so if the price of oil is, is down and we have somehow have to adjust to that, uh, we are fortunate to have a flexible exchange rate regime which helps the economy to adjust to that shock. But it is not a panacea, as I said, and it doesn't cure everything, and it's certainly not something to cheer for. Uh, we, we would, of course, prefer that oil prices be a little higher because that's an important export for Canada and that Canada uh, would then er be earning more for, through its export uh, uh, activities and it would be, of course, better for the regions that are bearing the brunt of this shock. The exchange rate really doesn't do much except a, a minor shock absorber to that shock. That shock is simply one that we have to bear and work our way through. So uh, it would be, uh, uh, you know, I, I would say that's a mischaracterization uh, as you outlay. You did mention that it could help manufacturing in places like Ontario or Central Canada. Yes. Uh, since the dollar went up, there have been a number of changes in, uh, specifically <coughs> in Ontario. 
uh, energy prices, non-oil energy prices going up dramatically. Um, <coughs> we're looking at payroll tax increases, several other factors. Do you expect to see a return of many of the jobs that did leave for a variety of reasons? Do you expect Ontario to gain that much back over the next little while in terms of the manufacturing sector? Well, we're, we're definitely seeing signs that, uh, that manufacturing exporters are benefiting from these conditions and growing their sales, as I mentioned some of the categories in my speech. Um, but um, the idea that somehow everything that was there before would come back is, is, is a bit of a stretch. What has to happen, in fact, is, as I did discuss in the, uh, one of the questions, is that it's usually growth in new companies um, which, which will fuel the growth in that other 80% of the economy. Yes, existing companies will have more sales and they'll, they'll invest more and create more jobs. That's the natural transmission of this process. Those companies were cutting jobs five and six years ago because the dollar was so high. So in some sense, those will be return stories, okay, Re recovering from, from, from a difficult situation for them. Uh, but the real story will be, are we generating new companies, brand new jobs? That's where the lion's share of new employment is created. It's by brand new companies. It's where productivity comes from. And that process slowed to, to almost nothing during the crisis and the year, few years after, where the data we show in the monetary policy report last October show that that process of building up, again, the population of companies in Canada has resumed. It's early, and we hope it keeps up. But that's the part that will replace some of the losses that happened back then. And so you have every reason to think that that growth will fill in the, that, that gap which emerged. Um, but but it's, it's not something like a mechanical thing at all. And it's certainly, again, going back to your earlier question, it's not why you think of the, the dollar being lower as a good thing. It's, it, what is lower is it's helping the economy to adapt to a reality, a new reality. Hi, uh, Mr. Polis, Kim McCrail from the Wall Street Journal. Thanks for taking these questions. Um, I think you said in the <coughs> speech that what we're seeing now is a reversal of the forces that drove the economy during the years when resource prices were rising. Yes. Now that we're on the other side of this and we're seeing <coughs> things move in the opposite direction, I'm just wondering if you could reflect on whether there are any lessons that can be drawn from, from this experience that either Canada or other commodity producing countries have had. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not really thinking of any right now, Kim. I would just say that uh, some, some have talked about um, did, we, did we become excessively enthusiastic or excessively exposed to energy? And I, I usually resist that argument because the market was telling us people were willing to pay up to $100 a barrel for oil. It would have been quite unusual behavior to have said, well, you know, I'm not going to take advantage of that by investing more in the oil patch. Um, it's just market signals. People respond to them. And we invest more, we produce more, we make more money, and everybody benefited. We, we, we estimated back a year or two ago that uh, the income level in Canada was about 7% higher overall. I mean, that's for everybody because of that rise in oil prices. And we are now, of course, reversing some of that income effect, as I discussed. Um, if, if there's a lesson in all that, it is that, um, you know, all, all commodity markets, and not just oil, appear to be going through what is a fairly textbook case of you invest more when prices are high, and of course those projects take years to happen, and no one's watching from above and making sure that it doesn't add up to too much. And so as a result, what we didn't notice was that growth in the shale play in the United States was gradually adding up to a lot of oil and enough to actually change the global oil market. And similarly for other commodities, the, the investments in copper and iron ore and so on uh, always happen when prices are high. And then, of course, you go through a typical, we call it the hog cycle in the textbook. It's because you... You grow more hogs when prices are high, and by the time they get to market, prices fall. So you kind of get this cycle, and those cycles are measured in years, uh, in the case of commodities, because hogs are faster. 
But so if there's a lesson, it's that, you know, you should never forget that there's always going to be a cycle. And for a while, maybe people talked about the, 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 the commodity super cycle, you know, it's because of fast growth in China and so on. And I think that was a little too simplistic. Uh, that, and I, you know, I, we did mention that risk all along the way, that that was perhaps too simplistic. And it turned out to be too simplistic. So I, I suppose that's a lesson, but it's a very old lesson. It's happened over and over in history. And, and sorry, just to follow up quickly on that, yeah. thank you. Um, when you say that uh, you, you referred to a textbook sort of cycle and a process that, um, that you can sort of expect <coughs> to, to go ahead, is there, is there nothing then that commodity producing countries like Canada, like Australia, uh, can do to mitigate against some of the experiences that they're having now? Um, you know, uh, you, you can look to, to Norway, perhaps, as an example of a country that seems to manage it well. But it's a very, very small economy. It's maybe easier in, in that case. Uh, but, but really, uh, being, being prepared with tools to buffer the effects, I think, is the best, the best thing that we can do. And, um, and so, monetary policy and, and fiscal policy, the automatic stabilizers in fiscal policy, continue to work very well. Uh, those things um, uh, help to cushion these blows. Um, but as I said, they, they can't change the fact, the fact that the price is now lower. Remembering though too, though, the other side of the commodity cycle is that there's a certain point where it just isn't worth it to produce commodities anymore, or to, certainly to invest in them. And that's always hard to figure out where that is, but commodities do stop falling. And then we go through the process where demand catches up to supply and prices recover. We all have that in the back of our minds. We're very reluctant to forecast when it would all happen, um, but we can rely on it because just as the fall in commodity prices has happened over and over in history, so has the rise. Bonjour, Raymond Fillion de TVA. Première question au sujet de la Chine. J'aimerais vous entendre sur la situation des marchés financiers. À quel point c'est inquiétant ou préoccupant pour le Canada, pour l'économie du Canada, ce qui se passe actuellement? <coughs> uh, merci. Uh, uh, le, le point critique pour moi serait si, si uh, un changement pour le, de la provision pour l'économie chinoise. C'est une question économique, pas financière. Les, les marchés financiers sont toujours plus volatiles que les, les fondamentaux. Les fondamentaux euh, seront peut-être touchés par la, la volatilité dans les marchés, mais principalement, les fondamentaux sont les fondamentaux. Euh, on verra un taux de croissance en Chine. Si le taux de croissance en Chine euh, diminue euh, euh, significativement, euh, ça, c'est une question pour nous, pour, pour tout le monde. Mais la volatilité dans un marché, ce n'est pas la même chose du tout. Donc, il n'y a pas lieu de s'inquiéter outre mesure? Mais certainement, le... euh, comme j'ai comme dit auparavant, c'est euh, quelque chose qu'on qu regarde euh, soigneusement. Euh, on fait des analyses constamment euh, pour comprendre la situation et les, les implications potentielles pour le Canada. Euh, mais les, les, les liens sont principalement les liens économiques, les liens réels pas les liens financiers. Alors, euh, pour le moment, il faut attendre et, et voir le, le résultat. Okay. Maintenant, c'est vraiment de donner. Oui, <rire> Mylène Crête de Radio-Canada. Oui. J'aimerais que vous nous expliquiez en français ce que vous entendez là, par cet ajustement de l'économie qui se fera un peu, les forces vont se dissiper d'elles-mêmes, ce que vous dites dans votre discours, euh, dans la traduction en français. Et deuxième question, euh, jusqu'à quel point des investissements en infrastructure du gouvernement peuvent rendre cette transition plus rapide, cet ajustement? <coughs> OK. Mais, euh, pour la, la question centrale, c'est qu'avec une euh, diminution des prix de, de pétrole, euh, <coughs> ça, ça, ça réduit euh, automatiquement le revenu total pour le pays, pour le Canada. Et comme j'ai mentionné, c'est euh, un montant autour de 50 milliards de dollars, ça, euh, 1500 par personne. Il faut ajuster euh, ce changement. Et l'ajustement, euh, c'est un ajustement euh, qu'on ne peut pas euh, changer l'effet. Il faut ajuster ça. 
Et les politiques, comme par exemple, euh, on, a, on a diminué le taux d'intérêt, le taux de change a suivi euh, le prix du pétrole. Ces, ces facteurs nous aident à ajuster. On a fait absorber euh, une portion de ce, de ce choc. Mais éventuellement, l'ajustement va prendre quelques années à finir. Euh, <coughs> Alors, dans, dans le niveau euh, régional, nous avons, pour le Canada, nous avons une économie diverse, mais au niveau régional, c'est moins diverse. Alors, nous avons euh, les ajustements qui sont entre les secteurs de l'économie et entre les régions. Et c'est l'inverse qu'on a vu durant les années euh, de 2002 à 2014. On a vu beaucoup de monde qui, euh, qui ont, euh, sont allés à Alberta ou à euh, 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 Labrador, New France, Saskatchewan, etc. Ça va inverser. Euh, partiellement, pas en total, mais parce, parce que ils ont, ce sont les autres économies avec les autres éléments qui, qui sont en pleine croissance. Euh, alors, c'est un, un ajustement difficile pour les individus. Euh, il faut avoir les politiques euh, euh, monétaires et fiscaux pour, pour aider à euh, absorber euh, les implications. Ça va? Oh, l'infrastructure, c'est peut-être une partie de cela. Mais pour moi, le, les investissements en infrastructure sont un, 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 un ingrédient important pour la croissance normale de l'économie, la croissance tendancielle. Et si c'est si possible d'augmenter la croissance tendancielle par un, un point, point 2, point 3, point, point 4, ça serait quelque chose qui, qui va, va nous donner les, les retombées pour un, durant plusieurs années. Et ça, alors, c'est un investissement, pas une dépense. Ça, c'est euh, la vraie, euh, vraie interprétation. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks, everybody.